Good, war good morning and welcome to the Awesome God Ministry. On this morning, I'd like to spend some time uh, based on some, uh, some prayer and some thought, uh, speaking from the title, When God Doesn't Do It. Mm. And I'm often reminded at this time of year when we start getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving and we're about to celebrate Christmas, one of the other things that goes right along with that oftentimes is our rate of suicide increases. And oftentimes people feel a great state of loneliness during the holiday season. And oftentimes I think at that, at that period of time, many people spend time uh, thinking and uh, commemorating and kind of putting a lot of thought into people who are very close to them where they spent hours and, and years of time celebrating and spending their Thanksgiving and their Christmases with. And oftentimes I think people start to reflect back on those who are no longer here. And uh, based on that and then just some things that happen to be going on in their own personal lives, I think oftentimes people just give up. And they decide to harm themselves because they feel like they're, they're lonely. They feel like they're their loved ones are gone and they don't feel like maybe life is going uh, as they planned or as they wanted it. And oftentimes when people get to a state of loneliness, um, I think sometimes people think, well, what is the reason and, you know, continue to be on this place called earth? Or um, sometimes people, I believe, uh, maybe misconstruedly think they're going to go join their loved ones who they've lost. So with that being said, I want to speak this morning on when God doesn't do it, yeah. um, because we will always experience some times in our life where we are praying, we are fasting, we are doing everything that we know how to do in order for God to change a situation, whether it be a loved one is sick and um, is, is dealing with cancer or some other kind of illness. And we are praying and we're fasting and we're just doing everything. And we call upon the elders of the church to pray. And we got everybody doing all the things that we know how and the word tells us to do. However, the outcome that we wanted does not happen. And so sometimes that's very hard for people, people to reconcile in their mind when God doesn't make the situation go the way they wanted it or the way they would have liked it to. And at that time, sometimes people start to question God. And I'm not talking about people in the world. I'm talking about people in the church. Mm -hmm. They start to question God as to, is he able? Was he listening? Was he ever able? And they really just started to question God. And they really are asking, well, God, why didn't it, why didn't the outcome turn out the way I wanted it to? I prayed, I fasted, I, we laid hands, we did all these things on that situation. I wanted my marriage to change. I wanted my children's life to change. We, 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 we go to prayer and we do everything that the word tells us to do and requires us to do in those times. Mm -hmm. And the my situation God, just does not end the way we want it to. So with that as, a, as an understanding this morning, I'd like to speak from when God doesn't do it. And the question itself, uh, it embeds two assumptions. When God doesn't do it, when you come to that way of, of even asking that question, it's two assumptions that you're making. The first assumption is God is a God of miracles. Because usually when we're asking God to do something, a lot of times it's a miracle type situation. We want him to change a situation that we don't see an out. We don't mm -hmm. see another way out. Okay. We see no other way. So we call on the only thing that we know and we call on God. So the first thing when God doesn't do it, we have to understand that we understand that God is a God of miracles. Now I ask you to turn to first scripture and we're going to be in quite a few scriptures today. Um, but the first scripture is Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 10, he finds himself saying something that we have to be reminded of and mindful of. And in Jeremiah 10, chapter 12, it says this. 
Jeremiah says, he has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom, and he has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. So oftentimes when we call on God, we are calling on him because we know that this is who he is. He's made the earth by his power, and he has established the world by his wisdom. Come on now. And then we also know that he has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. So we say when we come to that situation, that circumstance that we have no answers for, we see no way out of, we often are calling on this God that we know. Because we know that if anybody can do it, he can. Mm -hmm. The second scripture we can find in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 4 once again, we get to understand that the enormity and the gravity and the, the power of God. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which, which I have put in your hands, but I will harden his heart so that he will uh will not let the people go and understand what god says here he told he he, he he had told moses he wanted moses to go perform these these astonishing acts but the key thing that the lord is saying here he tells moses that pharaoh is going to be amazed at, at the miracles and almost implies that hey pharaoh is going to understand that you have to be working at a power outside of yourself Come on now. because the miracles that you're performing you of your own state could not do. But here's what the Lord said that is important. He understands, he says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart and I will not allow him to let the people go. So understand that God not only was controlling the miracles that he was having um, Moses perform and astonish Pharaoh, he also had power over Pharaoh's heart. So he is always in control of all situations. Amen. And oftentimes we grow up and we know that. And so when we get in these times of great despair or distress, this is the God we call on. Last scripture we can find in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40. We run across the instance here where... Jesus is speaking. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet uh, Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now understand what Jesus is saying here is Jesus. And we understand how powerful Jesus was, but Jesus even says here that you're going to have to go through something. Amen. And he says, just like the prophet Jonah had to go through, oftentimes we are going to have to go through something. So understand that when you lose a loved one or that situation doesn't turn out the way you wanted it to, that's not the end state. Mm, thank you, Lord. But you're going through something. You're going through a trial. You're going through. And so Jesus reminds those around him that don't ever think you're going to live on this earth and everything is going to go and be processed as you see fit because there are going to be some challenges on this place called earth and so most of us know these things and so we understand that when we are talking to God and we're praying to God we are praying to a God of miracles mm -hmm. Thank you. so that's the first thing we know and the second thing that when we say well when God doesn't do it the other thing that we have to be operating on is that believers are to pray without ceasing. So oftentimes, we will go at that point, 
when things go haywire in our life, when we don't have any more answers, when the, the, you know our, our kids, our loved ones, mom, dad, when they're laying in that hospital bed and the report's not good and things aren't sounding good, most of us, even those, ironically, who are not even saved, a lot of times their first response to that situation is, well, let's pray. Or let me go to somebody who knows the words of prayer. So people just know that they are to pray without ceasing. And so they know they're praying to a God. And why are they praying to this God? Because they know they're praying to a God of miracles, a God of all powerful, a God that's in control of everything. And we find that in the, the book of Thess First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, pray with out ceasing. And so oftentimes when we find ourselves in, in bad situations, our first instinct, the first thing we know is we say, I'm going to pray. And, or if, if, if even those that don't even pray, they will, two things I've noticed about people. One, if they don't pray, they will join a prayer or ask someone to pray for them. That's two things they'll do. They either will join in with praying even if they don't do it, or if they don't do it, they will say, will you pray for me? Because even at those times, they know that prayer is needed. And it's a requirement. And so go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. And this is what the Jesus is saying here. It's in the red. It says, if you then being evil know how to give, give good, good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And we understand that Jesus is saying, well, how do you ask the father? Well, we understand that the only way we can communicate with God is through prayer. Amen. Amen. And so when we're going through hard situations, turmoil in our life, most of us are operating from two understandings when we get when God doesn't do it or when we're saying, well, why didn't God do it or why didn't God work this out the way I wanted to? We're operating from two understandings. One, we got to know the God that we're praying to is a God of miracles. And the other thing we have to know by even asking a question like, why didn't he do it or what, what you know, why didn't he answer my prayer? You have to know and have some understanding that in order to even ask that question, you have to believe in prayer. So those are the two things that you have to at least be operating from to even ask that question. But I think there are three things that uh, require a little more critical understanding. So when God doesn't do it, when it doesn't turn out the way you wanted it to. Now it's kind of interesting, and we're going to talk about later how we transition from knowing this God of miracles and knowing this God that can answer all things to we start to switch and go a different direction. So the first thing we got to talk about here is the, the three critical points of understanding that just when it comes to that question is, first, God does not respond to our desires and he frequently allows circumstances uh, which we would not. Mm, come on. And he has that um, prerogative. Yep. As much as we yes, don't like does. it. Yes, he does. Yes, as he much does. as we don't like it, we have to understand that God does not always respond to our desires. Come on now. And oftentimes, frequently, he allows circumstances we wish would not happen. Go to Psalms 50. It's in, it's in the scriptures. Go to Psalms 50, verse 1. And we're going to hit three scriptures, two in the book of Psalms and, and one in 1 Peter. But read, read what it says here in, in Psalms 50, verse 1. It says, the, the mighty one. God, the Lord, has spoken and called the earth on, from the rising of the sun on, to the going to its going down. So understand that the mighty one, we're talking about sovereignty here. Yes, 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 yes. God is sovereign. He doesn't, and I understand that this makes some people uncomfortable, but if I if it makes you uncomfortable, then I would say what you have is a pride issue. And you probably want to check that because God requires you to be humble. So when you get to a position where you say, well, you mean God can just do what he wants to and he doesn't have to, I don't have to like it? He saw. He doesn't have to get our buy off, our sign off, our okay. 
And that is the sovereignty of God. And you have to get to a point in your Christian walk where you're okay with it. Because you have to be okay with it because you have to know that he is your beginning and your end. Come on now. Yes, he is. So anything that he allows in your life, you have to be okay with that. Because That's as that. the psalmist says here, the mighty one God, the Lord, has spoken and called mm -hmm. the earth. Mm -hmm. The place we spend our existence, he called that into being. Come on now. But then it says, from the rising of the sun to the yeah. going down of the same, yes. that's God. Nobody but God. I don't get to determine what days it rains, what days the sun comes out. I can't determine when the wind blows, when it's hazy, when it's foggy, when it's humid, when it's cool. I have no control over that. None of us get to control that. God gets to control that. He gets to control when... The trees start to change. When the seasons, even though we have a calendar that says this is the start of spring, this is the start of fall, scientists will tell you those are just guesstimates. Those are our are, are guess dates, our timing dates, but really only God controls when that transition, that season change actually happens. Man doesn't control that. Go to uh, Psalms 115. And understand the sovereignty of God. You have to understand the sovereignty of God. And you have to get to a point that you're okay with the sovereignty of God. Psalms 115, verse 3, it says, But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Come on now. That's the sovereignty of God. He does what he pleases. He doesn't, and I know it gets us uncomfortable sometimes because we always say, well, did you run that by me? And we always want somebody to check with us. Mm -hmm. God doesn't do that. And if you have a problem with that, once again, your pride is too big. You have a pride issue. Because God doesn't have to run it by you. When mom or dad gets sick, he doesn't have to say, is this okay? Is this the right time for you? Is this, is this, is this, time, is this, the, is this the right time and right season for mom to pass away? Or dad to pass away? Or son or daughter to pass away? Or aunts or uncles or grandmothers? He doesn't, he doesn't come to you and say, is now the right time? And he doesn't have to. Because that's the sovereignty of God. Amen. And I mean, could you imagine how wild that would be or how, how weird it would be if God came to you and said, well, is now the right time to take mother? Mm -hmm. I don't know that anyone would wake up and say, well, you know, God, I think this is the no, right no, day. No, 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 no. Th this is the right day. Hey, uh, is, is this the right day for... You, your marriage is getting to go through some trouble. Is this the right day for no. that to happen? Mm -mm. Nobody would do that. Nobody. Or nobody would, nobody would sign up and say, okay, God, yes, this is the right time. Mm -mm. No. So understand, but the sovereignty of God, he doesn't have to run that by you. He doesn't have to check it through because he is God. He is God. And he is in control of all no, things. No, 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 no. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. It says this. Um, it says, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Understand the scripture says, therefore, those who are suffering according to the will of God. So those who are suffering, those who are in pain, those who are hurting. But if it's in the will of God, the word says, commit your souls to him doing good as to a faithful creator. So only way you could do that is if you have an understanding and belief that your creator is faithful. Because it is going to be very hard for us to, when things are going bad, trust him. So he says, when, it's, when you're going through things and it's the will of God, the scriptures say, do good. And oftentimes, one of, the, one of the saddest things to see is someone going through something and when they turn their anger towards God. When their situation doesn't turn out the way they want. The first thing a lot of people will do is start to turn on God. 
Well, I was, I was going to church every Sunday. I was praying. I was fasting. I was tithing. I was doing all that stuff. And you still took my, you still took my son. You still took my daughter. My marriage still fell apart. I lost my house. I lost my job. And the first thing I do, I, I'm not, I'm going to stop. I, maybe that God thing isn't real anymore. I, I'm, I'm not going to church anymore. I don't care about that Bible. I don't read that mess. That's foolish. Mm. People will start to turn their back on God. But the word says at that point, if you know you serve a faithful creator. Come on now, Pete. Says do good. Amen. Do good. Because, not because you feel good. It didn't say feel good. It said do good. The word of God said God, do good. It says commit your souls to him. Yes, yes, yes. Not the pastor. Help us, Lord. Not the church. Not our job. It says commit yourselves to him, your faithful creator. Now, the other thing I will tell you is the reason you also want to commit yourself to him is the only person that can give you the answers. The only person that could possibly answer your question is the one that created the situation. The only one, when you're going through something sometimes, you say, well, God, how did we end up here? How did this happen? Why is my marriage in shambles? What, what, why am I, why, I, you know, why am I in this state right now? Mm -hmm. I'm so disconnected. I'm so far away from you. So the only person that can answer that question is the one that allowed the situation. Amen. So for you to turn your back on the one, you'll, you'll beat yourself up trying to answer a question you can't answer. Because the only one that has the answer is the only one that allowed the situation. Yes, thank you. So that's why the Bible says, turn to him. Amen. Because he has the, the only way you ever get to answer that question, he has the answer. The other thing that we have to understand, second thing we've got to understand is our tendency is to doubt God's sovereignty in the midst of turmoil. We don't doubt God when things are going good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we're being blessed, we don't doubt God. Oh, God is real. Oh, yeah. We'll tell everybody, God is real, he's awesome. But when we get into a, some turmoil, when life gets to going a little rocky, we start to question, does God really know what he's doing? And so go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, verse 31. And we will find there that Jesus is speaking again. And Jesus says this. But he said to him, if they did not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one ray a raised from the dead. Now he's talking to Lazarus here. Now let me give you a little, little background to what's going on. Lazarus has passed away. And Lazarus is talking to God from heaven. I mean from hell. And he asks God, he says, Can I just want to just come back? And I really want to save my friends and my, 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 I want to save my loved ones pretty much. I want to tell them that hell is real. Mm. And Jesus in this parable here, he responds this way. He says, but he said to him, if they did not hear Moses and the prophets. So he told Lazarus, he said, well, Lazarus, if they didn't listen to the prophets and Moses, Although you might think because they when you come and you tell them that hell is real and it, it, it is a real thing, he say, they're not going to listen to you. And so we have to understand that oftentimes when we're in a place of turmoil in our life and when you see people in turmoil, even if you say, well, we've been friends for years, if you come to them when they're going through, they just lost their mom or they just lost their job, they lost their home, family, family breaking up. If you come to them and you say something about God oftentimes, they get very defensive, get very angry. And so what you have to understand is people are going to question God's sovereignty when they're in the situation. And so that's what he was telling him. See, uh, Lazarus was in hell. He, uh, he was understanding. His, he's burning in hell. And he was like, I don't, want any of my, I don't want any of my loved ones to experience this. Let me go tell them. But Jesus said, you got to understand, when, when people are in turmoil, they're not going to listen to you. And so he almost was saying, if they didn't listen to the Pharaoh, they didn't listen to the people. It's been, many people have told the story. They tell them. They, you've had many people come teach you. Although you might think, and oftentimes we do think this, 
We say, well, man, we've been friends for years. Let me let me go speak the word of God to him. Let me go say some, you try to speak some comforting words. And you say something about scripture. You say something about the Bible. And people, when they're going through, it's like they never heard of God sometimes. And I'm not talking about people in the world. I'm talking about people that are in the church. And so, but you have to understand, people are going to question God's sovereignty when they're in turmoil. When things going wrong, people question God. They start to question yeah, I know we read all those scriptures. We just read scriptures about how powerful he was and how he placed it, how he did the earth and how he did all that stuff. But I don't know, God. I don't think you got this one right. And so most times people only say that when they're in the situation. When they find themselves in turmoil, they start to question, well, I don't know if God really knows what he's doing on this one. And I hear, I hear people say that oftentimes, especially when a young person will pass away and they'll say, well, man, you know, I just, I had, to, I almost questioned God on this one. Did he get this one right? That is within the And we, within heaven. Was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I did, I'm sorry, heaven, heaven, I'm sorry. I, I did say hell, I said heaven, then I said hell, you're right, I'm sorry. Correction there, heaven, I'm sorry. Um, then the, the the other thing we'll find, go to the book of 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and 8. And, uh, and, and, and 1 Corinthians 1, um, I'm sorry, 18, I'm sorry. And actually, um, this is a very interesting part. Scripture says, from the message of the cross is foolishness to those mm. who are perishing. Come on now. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Yes, it is. Hallelujah. And so when this talks about for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, when you're in a bad situation, don't come to me about no cross. Mm. Don't come to me about no Jesus. Don't come to me about that church thing. Don't come to me about that Bible. I'm going through. <laughs> Nobody don't want to hear about it. I don't want, I don't want to hear about God's sovereignty. I don't want to hear about God knows my beginning and my end. Because I'm perishing. I'm going through. I'm in turmoil. Don't talk to me about God. Mm. And so, but look what it says. It says, comma, but to us who are being us. saved in its yes. power of God. Mm. So understand, once again, it's the power of God, meaning you have to know who God is. Yes, hallelujah. And the key word there is it says the power of God. Yes, hallelujah. Which means you understand that God has the power to maybe have a situation go contrary to where you wanted it to go. Why? Because it's the power of God. He has control. Not us. As much as we as much as we like that not to be the case, God is in control. Mm -hmm. As much as we want to challenge it, as much as we want to question it, or as much as we want to say, well, did God get it right on this one? I don't know if God got this one right. It's the sovereignty of God. And I and I always say if it was an equation, life is the sovereignty of God plus free will, man's free will in play. That'll equal life. And oftentimes we go the other way. We'll blame it on God when oftentimes it's people's own free will. And that's a hard concept for us, a lot of people, to understand that this powerful God would give man on this earth free will. That's a hard thing for a lot of people to understand. But it, it, to me it's no different than when you're raising children. You raise them, you prepare them, you teach them. But at the end of the day, they have free will to make that decision. Doesn't mean you don't love them. You, and even they're gonna make bad decisions. And you love for them not to make those bad decisions. But they have been granted the opportunity, and we grant them the opportunity, our children the opportunity. We give them free will. We hope that through our teaching and through the things that we've discussed and how we raise them, that they make quote unquote right decision. Yeah. But guess what? They don't have to. Because they have a free will to do the exact opposite of what you're talking about. Yeah. God is no different. Go to Jeremiah 20, verse 7 and 8. Listen to what Jeremiah says here, talking about questioning. Now we understand we talked about Jeremiah before. Um and he was talking about who, in Jeremiah 10, uh, 12, uh, 10, 12, 
we just spoke about who Jeremiah, um, how he, he knew who God was. But now we find Jeremiah 10 chapters later. And now let's see what Jeremiah has to say about the mm -hmm. same God. He oh, says, oh, Lord, you induced me. And I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am, and he pretty much said he's delusional daily. Everyone mocks me. So understand what was going on here. Jeremiah had, he was, he was called um, to pretty much ask the people of Israel to repentance. And so he said, okay, well, God, well, you, you know, uh, you, 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 he, and he, Jeremiah said, now he said, you induced me, you persuade, he almost said, God, well, you fooled me into this. You deceived me, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. To take you, you told me to go speak to your people, go talk to your people, get them to, the, 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 to, to, uh, come back and to restore themselves to you, to ask for repentance. And you got me out here and then these people are done, they done a one day, they, they so far from you, they going opposite direction, everything I'm telling them. And so he said, well, God, you fooled me. I thought, I thought you sent me out here to speak to these people and they were going to be friendly and they were going to like me. And I tell you this, anybody that's been called to speak and teach the word of God knows that is the biggest falsehood ever. Because if you get into the ministry thinking you're going to gain a whole lot of friends and people are going to like you, you're going you're gonna to feel like Jeremiah. And he said, well, I was fooled. I thought, I thought it was going to be like everything I see on TV. I thought everybody was going to smile and be happy when I come in the room or people going to want to see me coming or people were going to want to call and talk to me. And what you find out and what Jeremiah was finding out here is the people that were mocking, they're making fun of him. They didn't want to be around him. They're making fun of what he was doing. And so he was just saying to God, man, you, you, you strong. He almost was saying, you, you fooled me and it cost you stronger than me. You done pushed me out here and you prevailing because you just making me look like a fool. That's, that's what Jeremiah was saying. That's the way he was feeling at that time. And he was upset that the people who he saw the, the fallacy in their ways, he was trying to get them to turn, and they weren't turning. So when he was going through it, mm -hmm. he pretty much went back on God. He said, God, I don't think you know what you're doing. I don't think you got this right. I don't think you got these people out here making fun of me. And he was, he was kind of questioning what he knew about God. Go to Jeremiah uh, 15. Flip back a couple chapters. I'll tell you, let's go to 14 first. Go to 14, 18. See what Jeremiah had to say. Once again, Jeremiah 10, 12, he was telling us how powerful and how mighty God was. 14, 18. We find Jeremiah. He going through again. He said, if I go out to the field, then behold, those uh, slain with the sword. And if I enter the city, then behold, uh, those sick with, um, from famine. Yes, both prophet and priest go about in the land they do not know. So mm -hmm. understand that he kind of got out there and Jeremiah was just kind of like, man, I'm just seeing this terrible all around me. And so he was kind of walking around here and he said, I'm just kind of seeing bad stuff. And at that point, he almost is kind of questioning God like, I don't know, God, everywhere I seem like I'm turning, mm -hmm. I'm seeing bad stuff. And he said, when I ended, he said, I'm seeing people be killed. Are we not seeing people be murdered? I was just at the, at the elementary school on Friday. I was talking to one of the guidance counselors there. And she was saying how they are having more kids. And they have grown. The number of families needing assistance with food on a daily basis is growing. Is growing. She has more number of families in need this year than years past. And so we're starting to see people being slain in the street. And Jeremiah was like, people being slain in the street. He said, look around. He looked around. People starving. And then he says, yes, the prophet and the priest go in the land they do not know. So he's saying, he said, man, we go out here to preach this word and we go out here to speak to your people. And lo and behold, we look around and I'm seeing people be killed over nothing. And I'm seeing your people starving. And he said, man, I, I'm in a world I don't even know. And so he was almost questioning God like, well, God, is this, is this it? I'm going well, I'm, I'm to walk out here and preach this word of God, preach this word of love and compassion. Mm -hmm. And a word where I'm walking around seeing people what? being slain mm -hmm. and killed. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing people start hungry. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody want to help me. 
And you got me out here trying to preach this thing, love and compassion and how, how much you care about us. And he was just like, the, pro we, the prophet and the priest, we don't even know this world we're in. This, this word, the same word you called me to preach and teach the word of God to, I don't even, I don't know anymore. And so Jeremiah was kind of questioning God. Flip over to uh, Jeremiah 15, 10. He says this, Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent me for interest. Every one of them curses me. So Jeremiah was out here in this world, and he said, woe is me. He was in a bad state. Jeremiah said um, that you have borne me. And so he said, hey, okay, God, you put me on this earth, called me to do something. And he said, a man of strife, a man of contention in the whole world. He said, I don't have nothing. He said, I only have lint. I don't have nothing. I don't have nothing for interest. And he says, nor have men lent me for interest. So he said, not only do I, I don't have anything. I'm out here. You call me to preach this word. You call me to call your people into a state of repentance. I don't have anything and I can't even get any of these people that you called me to, to help. I can't even get them to lend me anything. And so Jeremiah says, and then he says, everyone curses me. So he was almost, he was at a point where he was going through and he was kind of questioning, okay, God, look, look, let's do that. Go back to Jeremiah 10, 12 and listen to what, read what Jeremiah said of who God was now before he started going through. Jeremiah 10, 12, flip over a few. He says, he has made the earth by his power. Remember, it says by his power. So he's talking about the sovereign. He's talking about God is in control. And then he says he has established the world by his wisdom. He has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. But now he's starting to question, you done called me out here to do some work, God. And I, I don't know. I think you, I don't think, I don't, maybe you didn't understand what you was asking me to do. Or maybe, maybe you got me fooled, God, because I thought you was in control of this thing. I thought you had power. But what I'm looking around at, it seemed like, it seemed like everybody else was in control. And so Jeremiah almost was starting to, based on his circumstance, he was starting to question where or who God was. He was questioning that sovereignty of God. And then let's go to chapter 17 really quick. Flip over to 17. Jeremiah once again has some questions. Jeremiah 17, 12 says this. A glorious high throne from the beginning is a place of your sanctuary. So understand here. Now, sometimes people get to this place now where they get called out here and, and people, we, we know this to happen. People have been called into, remember that, we are, they have been called into ministry. Nobody said forced. They were called into ministry. But then when things start to get a little shaky, turmoil starts to happen, they almost look up at God and say, well, you sitting up there on high and you got me down here doing the dirty work. And once again, that's a subtle sign of questioning who's in control because you start to look around and look at the situation and you start to almost get this idea or this opinion that you're in control of doing something. Come on now. And understand, you've been called by God to do work. So, when you look around and you say, "Well, man, it, it don't seem like it don't seem like my work is having any effect. It don't seem like anything is working for me." Understand, you don't work for the people. In terms of, if you think your pay is how people perceive you or accept you, be very careful. Your ultimate test is the one who called you. It's God. Come on now. And so if God tells you to do something and you're doing it as God instructed you to do, don't get caught up and look around what things look like around you because you will get a bad impression. You, you get the wrong picture because on, what, what, when you're called to do something for God, so oftentimes the people ain't going to move the way you wanted them to move or how fast you thought they were going to move or the ones that you thought were going to move, they didn't move. But understand, God called you. God is in control of that situation. So no matter what the circumstance looks like, no matter if you're walking around and seem like every time you hit the TV, somebody doing something crazy, killing innocent people, and you're like, man, this, this world, I don't see, no, I don't even know, should we even talk? I don't know if this 
talking about this God thing, talking about love. I don't know that message old. I don't think that works anymore. Or you start turning on and you seeing kids starving, kids, parents overdosing, and they li letting the kids oh, live two and three days in houses with no running water and all that stuff. And you start looking at it, you say, God, I don't I'm know if I can talk about this here. love. I'm I don't know here. if I, that's an old message. I don't know if I don't want to hear that. Understand, you better not look at these people because you'll miss your call. And you'll miss the call that God had and, and told had for you. And the last thing that we have to talk about in that understanding is we must embrace the sufficiency of God's grace in all, in all circumstances. Amen. And I understand that's hard sometimes because that just don't seem like that's enough. Sometimes people say, well, you know, we were talking about that once before. Uh, Pastor uh, spoke on when people say, well, all I can do is pray. It's, they, they've almost, it's like that's nothing. Right. And it's, we, we, we're the same way with God's grace. It's like, yeah, God, you're great. I got, okay, great. I got God's grace. Okay, great. And we almost throw that out there like, well, it's just God's grace. But go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read 7 through 9 here quickly. It says this, And least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. A throne in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Least I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for mm -hmm. you, for my strength has made, is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, this is a hard place to get to because understand what it's saying here. He says, he called out three times. Now he said, hey, God, this in front, this, this pain that I'm feeling, take it away from me. And he says, the only response he got back. Now, you got to understand, let's understand the picture here. Mom has passed away. My child has passed away. My, my, my life as I knew it, my, my family, my home is in disarray. It's broken. And you crying out, you're pleading to God. Change this situation. Fix it, God. Get it back on. And the only thing you hear back from God is, my grace is sufficient. That don't feel good at that time. And so that's where he was. So he calling out, he pleaded. You know, he fight, he say the devil, he fighting against the devil and he pleading with God. And God offers and says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is perfect in your weakness. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, he says, my grace is sufficient. But understand, you got to have an understanding and you got to be accepting of who God is to be okay with that. Because he says, my grace is sufficient. And he says, for my strength is perfect in your weakness. So understand when you're calling on God, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad place to be. Because he says here in the scripture, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. If you don't understand who God is, oftentimes you'll want to run around in this place called earth. And you'll want to constantly be in a place of power. One of man's biggest problems is man wants to be in control. Amen. He wants power. But God says here, if you're in control, and if you have all the power, then understand that I now become weak. And so, why as much as that might hurt us, as much as that might be painful to understand, he says, when you're going through, one, he gives you two things. He says, my grace is sufficient. And then he says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you have no control, 
When you're out of control, you have no answers. When you don't have, you don't have anything. You're weak. You're broken down. He says, my strength is made perfect. Mm -hmm. Why? Because mm -hmm. I'm the only way you're going to make it through. But you have to understand and recognize that I am the only way you're going to make it through. And so you have to understand that even though, you know, he asked for it, but he didn't get it. And the only thing God came back, he says, my grace. And I was thinking about that. And I think sometimes we probably need to teach on grace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because when you say the only thing he offered was grace, you don't put in how, how powerful grace is. And the only way I can think of it is if you, if you are probably the, the most, the easiest way you can think of grace in the simplest form is if you've ever been a child and you know you've either done some things or you haven't done everything up to standard as you've been asked by your parents. And then you ask for something. And maybe they don't get it right away. Maybe they do. But the fact of the matter is you in your own mind know you are not deserving because you didn't meet the standard in which they set. However, they still provide it for you. What you're experiencing is grace because you're not deserving of it, but it is bestowed upon you out of love. And so when you say, well, all he got was grace, Understand that no, you're getting something that you're not deserving of. Come on now. You have get, God has granted you something that through your actions, through your behavior, you're not, you shouldn't be getting. But out of love, He grants you grace. Out of love, amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And so it's just like as a child, when you get something and you know you weren't deserving. You usually have one or two reactions. You were just so elated and so happy with your parents that they got it when you when you knew you weren't deserving, or you say, "Well, man, I got over on them." But oftentimes, when somebody blows your mind and they do something that you weren't expecting, because you didn't do everything that you were required to do, and they still come and blow your mind, most times the biggest thing you are is grateful, because you they have shown you grace. Because you weren't deserving of it. Go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I mean, chapter 12, we'll read verses 1 and 2. And it says this, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which is so easily ensnared us, and let us run with endurance the race uh, that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand or the, uh, the right hand of the throne of God. So understand what the writer is saying here. Especially in verse 2. He says, when you get when you're going through, when you're in that situation where you're starting to say, Well, God, I've been crying out, I've been pleading. And the situation just didn't turn the way I wanted it to. He, the Bible says at that point, what you really need to do is look to God as your example. Amen. Because you have to understand, and we're going to read here shortly, you have to understand even Jesus Christ himself. He made some requests. However, understand, we're going to read it. Jesus made a request. But then he ended the request with, Father, thy will. Thy will yeah. Because he understood his father at the end of the day. Even though it was going to be to his detriment, to his pain, it was in the father's plan. And the father was in control of the situation. Mm -hmm. And he was doing his father's business. So even though oftentimes we make our requests, we pray and we want... We wanted them to cure mom. We wanted them to, to cure dad. We wanted them to save our son, save our daughter. We wanted them to save our marriage, save our situation. And he does not do it. He says, turn to Jesus as your example. 
And what did Jesus do? It says, looking into Jesus, the, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him mm -hmm. endured the cross. Mm -hmm. Understand the cross wasn't fun. The cross wasn't easy. But understand too, it says before, uh, but it says the uh, who for the joy that was set before him. Well, who said it before? Come on now, say it. The Father. Amen. The sovereign God, the creator. Yes, he endured. Come on now. He endured the cross, despising the shame. Come on, come on. And has sat down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus. So he had to go through the process. It was some pain. Yes. It was some people laughing, some people joking, some people spitting. It was a beating involved. He was at a low state. But the end game wasn't what happened to him on this earth. But it was the fact that he was going to spend eternity at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And when you're going through and when you're in a situation, you say, well, when God doesn't do it, don't let this earthly situation and these earthly situations and circumstances control your eternity. Amen. So understand that we have a bigger calling. Now let's go to Matthew 26 real quick. And let's read Jesus here as he was pleading. And I do want to, I want to make sure before we get to seven things, I do want to make sure we understand what he was pleading for because I don't sometimes think people get confused and think God was, I mean, Jesus was afraid to die. Or something. And that, that wasn't it. Um, go to uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. We're going to read 36 through 46. And it says this. A lot of this is Jesus speaking. Then Jesus came to them to a place uh, called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go pray over there. And then it, it, we, we, uh, to speed things up, we know the story. So he told his disciples, you guys stay here. I'm going to go pray. And he understood the end is near. He understands he is going to go bear the cross. So he, But he wanted to go pray. He wanted to go talk to his father. And so he told his disciples, you guys sit here and I'm going to go pray. And so let's jump down to 39. It says, and he went a little further and fell on his face. And he prayed saying, oh, father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nonetheless, not as I will, but as you will. Amen. So, Father, if you can, let mother stay a little bit longer. Let father stay a little bit longer. Let my, let my, let my situation change. But Jesus ended that prayer by saying, not my will, Amen. but what is the will of the Father? Amen. Because he is in control. And then it says in 40, and then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what could you not watch over me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. And again, a second time he went away and prayed saying, oh, father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. So then he goes back, he says, Father, okay, if I got to do this, your will be done because I'm answering to the sovereign God. Then he says in 43, it says, and he came and found them sleep, asleep again, and their eyes were heavy. And uh, so he left them, went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So Jesus, and I want to be real clear here, Jesus made a request to his father. Mm -hmm. he, was getting, he was in a situation it wasn't a good situation, and it wasn't a situation that ain't, he, he had got to the point, he understand the end is near, but he was like, man, I don't want to go through this situation. Now, it's not that he didn't want to endure the cross. What Jesus is asking oh, and requesting man. is why he says, do I have to do this? What Jesus understands and knows is that when he takes on the sin of the world, mm -mm -mm. 
his father is going to turn on him. Separate from God. Come on. And so what he's asking here is, Father, Come do on. I have to endure life Without separated Come from him? Come on now, preach that. Amen. And so sometimes people say, well, he didn't want to go through the cross. It wasn't the cross. Come on. It wasn't the pain. It wasn't the spitting on. It wasn't that. It wasn't the mockery. It was that he knew he was going to be separated from his father and he had never had that experience. Never. But he knew it was not a good experience. Come on. And so he asked to be taken. He said, well, father, can I not have to be separated from you? you. Jesus, thank you, Lord. And so he was asking for that not to have to happen because he had never known a life without his father. Never. He'd always been able to. For his father to be looking at him right face there, to face. Right there. Come on in. But he knows when he takes on the sins of the world that his father's going to turn from him because he cannot he be, cannot. he can't look at sin. He can't be a part of it. So he, he wasn't praying that I don't want to go on this cross. He was saying, do I have to be separated from you, Father? Have to pray. Mm. And so he was praying and saying, well, okay, God, I really don't want to be separated from you. But if it's your will that I take on the 